All right, so I think we're just gonna give everyone a bit of time to get settled and then I think we'll get started. All right, so I think um, everyone's coming in, so let's just get started. So good day, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's Youth AI Lab Talk. And I'd like to give a warm welcome to all of our audience members that are joining our, us tonight and joining our Youth AI community. Um, we're very excited to have you all here. Before introducing today's talk, I'd like to give a quick overview of our last talk and our upcoming talk. So in the last Youth AI talk, a Professor Fei Fang from CMU shared her exciting work on integrating learning with computational game theory for addressing societal challenges. It was really amazing to see how machine learning algorithms were applied intelligently to solve real world problems such as infrastructure security, wildlife conservation, and food security. You're welcome to watch the replay of this fantastic talk on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash youth AI lab. On April 24th, we will host Dr. Alon Halevi. Um, Dr. Halevi's talk will focus on integrity in the age of AI, covering issues such as misinformation and fake news. He is currently the director of Facebook AI, a world-renowned computer scientist, successful entrepreneur, and world-leading expert in AI, machine learning, and natural language processing. Dr. Halevi has been leading AI and big data research efforts in various companies such as Facebook, Megalodon Labs, and Google. Registration will open at the link I'm providing in the chat in early April when his schedule is finalized. Next, my co-host Alex Turk would just like to share some logistics of today's talk. Hi everyone, I'm Alex. So before introducing Professor Bohan, I'd like to pre uh, briefly go over the logistics of the talk. So because we have our audience watching from the YouTube live stream as well as on Zoom, um, we'll be doing Q&A through a platform called Slido. So you can either go to the URL in the chat or go to sli.do um, and enter the uh, event code on the screen um, and you can access the Q&A platform. Feel free to submit questions throughout the talk, but we'll only be answering questions in the Q&A session at the end of Professor Bohan's talk. Now, let me introduce today's speaker, Professor Kwabena Bohan. Dr. Bohan is a professor of bioengineering at Stanford University with a joint appointment in electrical engineering. Dr. Bohan is one of the world's leading experts in low power computer chips that work like the human brain. He's the founder of Stanford's Brains in Silicon Lab. And his scholarship is widely recognized and has won numerous distinguished awards. He's been invited to give over 70 seminar, plenary and keynote talks. These include a 2007 TED talk a computer that works like the brain that has been viewed half a million times. Professor Bohan is a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Today, Professor Bohan will share his pioneering research in building brain-like computer chips and their potential impacts on AI. Let's give a warm welcome to Professor Bohan. Thank you, um, Alex and uh, Peter for inviting me and for um, the wonderful introduction. I think you guys are doing a fantastic job. Um, I watched some of the videos and I, I must say, um, you yeah, in, in about a couple of years, I mean, this is gonna be what everybody's gonna be watching, yeah. <laughs> and so um, let me dive right in so we can stay on time here. And um, let me get my timer going here. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen which should be just fine. And then I'll start the slides. And so, uh, okay, what's happening? Okay, so um, here we have it. Um, I, are you with me now? You've got my first slide? Yeah, looks good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, welcome to my uh, study uh, over here on the Stanford campus. I'm going to start by talking about uh, 
the state of the art in AI, which you guys must be very familiar with given the nature of this uh, channel. And, um, but the most fascinating aspect to me right now is GPT-3. And this is a quote from, um, from GPT-3, uh, let me see. I taught myself everything I know just by reading the internet. And now I can write this column. The mission of this op-ed is perfectly clear. I am to convince as many human beings as possible not to be afraid of me. So um, GPT-3 was asked to write a column for the Guardian newspaper. And these are some quotes from that column. And um, so don't be afraid, um, you know, welcome our AI overlords. And um, he, this is what the, uh, <laughs> the editor of the uh, Guardian had to say about it. Editing G GPT-3's op-ed was no different to editing a human op-ed. We cut lines and paragraphs and rearranged the order of them in some places. Overall, it took less time to edit than many human op-eds. So the, guy, the editor at least was convinced that AI is really operating at the level of uh, an intelligent, well-educated human being. And um, this is amazing. This is something you know very few of us working in the field expected 10 years ago. And so how do we get to this point? Um, and so I'm gonna sort of talk about that, basically lift the, the hood and show you what's happening inside GPT-3. And there was a recent breakthrough just three years ago that allowed this to happen. So an entirely new kind of neural network. Um, and it's taking over all these other different kinds of tasks. So there's an example of what's called natural language processing but you see it's uh, as I'll show later. And after sort of showing you where we are in terms of the state of AI, the art of AI, you know, which is the performance is amazing. I'm going to touch on the downsides of the way we are doing things now, which is not sustainable. And this is where we can learn from the brain. So then I'll start talking about how we could do things differently and what kind of future or what kind of transformation would happen if we we're able to do that. I think it's going to positively transform our experience, the user's experience of this technology. And then I will, um, after that, at the end, I'll basically show you some, yeah, basically very simple demonstrations of how this might possibly work. And um, then, you know, I'm just trying to be futuristic here. Most of this is still to be done. And so um, this is GPT-3. It receives inputs in the form of these vectors. Each vector represents a word. And it's an autoregressive model, which means that it, you know, as after it sort of processes each of these words, then it generates the next word, which is supposed to be the response to this query. And then by feeding that next word back in as an input, the, the word it generates back in a, is an, as an input, it can generate another word and it can keep going. And this is how it sort of wrote that article that I quoted from. So this would just start the animation. We take the first word, the second one, robot must obey the orders given it. And now GPT-3 starts responding. Okay, human. Okay, and which is the right response. And so, um, how does it do this? Well, it's actually in principle very simple, right? It's just a layered, a bunch of layers that are enchained. And so you've got this, when you take one of those layers that I showed you in the previous slide and you look under what's inside them, there are two stages. There's what's called a self-attention stage. What that means is like when we read the sentence, the animal didn't cross the road because it, when we are processing the word it, we are attending to animal, that's how we bind them together. And it was tied, right? And so the way that GPT-3 does this is using this self-attention mechanism here, which operates on these vectors that represent these words. And then after that's done and it produces an output by attending to some particular part, then we use a traditional neural network, which talking to you high school guys, this is your father's neural network, whereas self-attention is not your father's neural network. 
uh, we go through two stages of that, two layers of that, and we produce the final output. And then we just keep stacking these, what are called transformer decoder layers. And the more we stack and the wider we make these vectors, the more powerful it becomes, which is, we still haven't reached the end of that. And so what's happening inside this self-attention layer? Well, you're seeing the vector that represents thinking in this case is multiplied by this matrix to give you a query, by this matrix to give you a key, and to give by this matrix to give you a value. And the same is done for the vector that represents machines, okay? Now, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this query and you're going to compare it with the key and you'll get a score. Basically, you take the dot product of these two things. If you've taken linear algebra, you learn all about that and you get a score. And then you also compare the query with the key for machines and you get another score. And the idea is that if the score is higher, then it means that you want to pass the value associated with thinking to the output rather than the value associated with machines, okay? So what you, before you do that, you're gonna do that by computing a weighted sum of these two values. And you do that first by um, normalizing the scores and soft maxing them, okay? Which tends to amplify the difference. It's more like a winner take all. So you get a big weight for the value one and a little weight for the value two. And when you add them together, you get this vector, which is where you pass to the next layer. And so you can, you can, so this is what's happening. You're doing this kind of similar, computing these similarity scores, and then you're weighting these associated vectors, and then you are passing them along. And then over here, you can do further remapping of this vector to some different vector using these two stages of this neural network. And so that's what's happening. Um, and then in addition to that, you tend to, it tends to work better if you also include these residual connections, which allow you to add the vector that came in to the vector that goes out. That, that means you only have to compute the difference between the vector that came in and the vector you want to send out or what's called the residual. And you also have versions of this architecture, this transform architecture where there's feedback from upper layers in the stack back to these layers or in a whole other stack that would, for example, translate English into French or something like that. So that's basically what's happening. And back in 2017, this paper was published. It was called Attention is All You Need that proposed this transformer architecture. And OpenAI jumped on top of this and just, you know, they have access to immense computing resources and, you know, billions of dollars. <laughs> and, and, and they scaled from the original transformer model to 12 layers here. The original one I think just had six layers. And the size of the vectors that they were using had 76, 768 components. And then that was GPT-1 with 117 million weights. And then a year later, we got GPT-2. This is the one where if you're following the field, they said it was too dangerous to release it, but then you know, you can't compete with the internet. People just were able to develop something just as powerful. So they released it. And this one had 1.5 billion weights, 46 transformer decoder stack and 1600 dimensional vectors. And just last year, they introduced GPT-3, which is what I was giving you an example of, its, of what it does. And that had 96 layers or stack of 96 of these decoders and 12,000 dimensional vectors. So we've gone over three years, 1,500 more parameters, 1,500 times more parameters, eight times more uh, taller stack, and 16 times wider stack, okay? And so that's pretty insane because it takes a lot of compute power to be able to train GPT-3 now. So if you compare GPT-3 with GPT-2, uh, this plot here uh, shows you model sizes going from 100,000 weights to 100 billion weights, which is around where GPT-3 is, is this last yellow line here. And, you know, what's happening is very interesting. If you take, you know, a moderate or a small size model and you keep training it by feeding it more text that you scar from the, from the internet, your, um, as you use more compute, 
your error will drop. And this error is basically the probability that it gets the, it makes a mistake predicting the next word in the text that you fed it, right? So you, you crop a bunch of text from some book, you feed it into GPT-3 and it should give you the next word on that page in that, in that book after, up to the point you cropped it, right? And so what you find is that that error in it giving you the correct next word goes down and then at some point you plateau. If you keep doing more compute training for more words and so forth, you don't get any better. And it turns out that if you had started with a bigger model, you know, for the same amount of compute, you would have got lower to a, to a lower uh, error, right? And so there's an optimum model size for any kind of compute that you have available. And it follows this parallel over here, which has an exponent of 1 20th. And so from GPT-3 to GPT-2, we increase the weights by 120. And we increase the amount of data that we trained it text basically by a factor of five. And we used about 600 times more compute to do that. And the error dropped by 1.3 divide by 1.3 or 23%, okay? Because we are following this par law, which has an exponent of 1 20th. So this is telling you why you need so much compute to train these things. And um, it turns out that actually language modeling as it's called, getting that next word right, it's very difficult. This is much harder than recognizing an image or even translating from like English to French or whatever. So it's kind of like a benchmark uh, you know, uh, performance test. Now, so, you know, how much, how many, you know, can we compute, <laughs> can we compute, continue to true compute at, at this problem? Well, what you're looking at here is since 1980, um, there's an interesting trend here when you look at how much compute researchers have been using to train the state of the art neural network. And it was going at a rate that much what's called Moore's law before 2013, doubling every two years, just like transistors on a chip. And then after 2013, when people realized that deep nets really were commercially useful, and you know the hyperscalers like Google, Facebook, OpenAI started jumping into the game, uh, compute has been increasing seven times faster than Moore's law. It's doubling every three and a half months or tenfold more compute every, every year. And in GPT-3, GPT-2 to GPT-3 case, it's actually like I showed you 600 fold more compute. So they are just even going faster than, <laughs> than, the, than the, normal hype, the normal trend. And of course, this is not sustainable, right? Because before when we were relying on Moore's law, we had twice as many transistors on a chip. And so it means the chip was twice as powerful and it didn't really use much more energy to do twice as much compute. So it wasn't getting more expensive to do this, but now we're actually going faster than the efficiency of the chips is increasing. And so that costs more money to do that. And so at the at right now, GPT-3 takes about $4.6 million to train. It uses about a trillion words of text. Um, it takes like 355 GPU years, running 355 GPUs for one year. And that emits as much carbon as running 50 cars for one year. So we've seen sort of the energy that uh, Google's data centers use basically triple over the last seven to eight years. And that's not sustainable, obviously. And so that's where we are. You know, we've made a lot of progress, but it's happening in a way that's not sustainable. And we really have to find a way to use less energy for each calculation so that we can, with the same you know, uh, amount of electricity going into a data center, we can actually train a bigger model. Now, or we can move away from that paradigm altogether. There's nothing that says that we have to be in the cloud. What if we did this on our own phones, right? What will it take for your phone to run AI? Uh, this is what I like to call a librarian in your pocket because you know, uh, GPT-3 has read every, every book that has been written, basically all the uh, literature <laughs> that's interesting. And um, it knows way more than most of my intelligent friends in terms of different subjects and depth and breadth. So if I could be running this on my phone, I could have a very interesting conversation with it and I could continue that conversation because uh, 
it's not in the cloud and they are not making a batch where you know they put all this these questions from all these different people and so on and so forth we just continue our conversation with where we left off now so apart from saving energy because it's running on your phone you're also going to be personalized because there's a batch size or what we call one just you are the single user whereas when a bunch of people query GPT-3 in the cloud. It waits till about 200 queries come in. Then they load the model and then they process all those queries in one shot. So you can customize to an individual user. And of course that delay to go to the cloud and come back is annoying to have a conversation in real time, which you could do if it was running locally on your phone. And lastly, you know, uh, I'm, you know, a lot of people are concerned about, you know, shipping their data back and forth because somebody could hack it, right? And so if it stayed on the device, then you keep your own data and, and it's secure. And so this is kind of how we could possibly transform our experience with AI if we're able to do this locally on our own phones. It turns out that right now to run GPT-3 on your, on your phone, basically it will run 15 times slower than real time. So, you know, you talk for a minute and you wait 15 minutes for it to process and it comes back with its response. And it will drain your battery in no time, basically. Your battery will have to be uh, much, much bigger because basically in a couple of hours, I think in like two hours, you would drain your battery. And so overall, your, your, your processes on your phone will have to use 200 times less energy per calculation in order to do this real time without draining your battery. And so that's where a neuromorphic approach to computing comes in because it turns out that our brains are super energy efficient in terms of the amount of energy they use to do each calculation. There's no competition, it's orders and orders of magnitude less than what we can do right now. And so that's the inspiration for what I call neuromorphic chips. These are chips that are based on the organizing principles of the brain uh, proposed by Kavamid in the, uh, in the mid eighties. And um, the challenge here is that, you know, you know, cognition arises from structures that span six spatial scales, you know, from down at the, you know, molecular level, you know, this is a little strand of protein or something that forms a channel and this is like on the nanometer scale or Armstrong scale, all the way to your entire brain or body, which is on the, you know, centimeter, it's several centimeters scale, right? And so we've got all this incredible amount of detail and structure, right? And these different structures at these different scales operate at six different temporal scales. So you have things happening here in the ion channels and these proteins where they are vibrating and there's the opening and closing in picoseconds. And you, then you've got things happening at the channel level, which is like microseconds. Then you've got things happening when you generate a signal that goes from one neuron to the other, to the other on the millisecond time scale. And then of course, you know, we have in this conversation where you operating on the seconds time scale, we have to remember what we said and so on and so forth, and even longer than that in terms of long-term memory. So it's a very complicated <laughs> structure. And the challenge is, you know, what level of abstraction is the right one? You know, do we need to take into account all this detail happening down here? Or can we just stick with some network, abstract network of nodes that are connected together, like we do in these deep neural networks? Or is there something going on in between here that we are giving up that's making us use a lot more energy and be a lot less efficient than the brain, which means we can't keep up with what the brain is doing. Um, and so that's the, the uh, question, main question I want to address. And this is an evolving, you know, uh, kind of challenge here because, you know, we keep learning more and about the brain and we keep learning more about the limitations of our technology and the, both of those two things, you know, are telling us you know, whether we are missing something and, whether we could be doing something else. And so the idea is which features can we ignore and still preserve the brain's supremacy over computers? And I'm using supremacy in the same way that people building quantum computers talk about supremacy. In other words, as the problem gets bigger, 
the gap between what the brain does and what our computers are able to do gets even bigger, right? That means it's the exponent, it's the scaling, okay, not the actual, you know, an individual operation may be more expensive or less expensive, but the number of operations you have to do and how that grows, how rapidly that grows, that's what determines which approach is supreme. And so <laughs> that's the, you know, computing capacity, how work that you do to solve a problem scales with a problem size. And, you know, I'm using the word work here as in terms of energy that we have to, <laughs> we have to consume. Okay, I'm not doing it in terms of theoretical computer science where they just count number of, you know, operations or something like that, right? And we know that the amount of work that we have to do or that scale, the way it scales, whether it's quadratic or exponential or whatever, is determined by the primitive operations that the computer uses and the signaling codes that it uses. So in the case of quantum computing, which you see here with Pichai and you know, one of Google's uh, quantum computing researchers, and this is the chip that's sitting inside this DWA down here. And all of this machinery here is to be able to talk to room temperature from like two Kelvin or something like that. And, um, you know, so a quantum meter, for example, we exchange classical bits for quantum bits. So those are the codes that we're using. And Conjunction for entanglement. This is just AND logical operation versus or AND or NAND and, uh, and uh, disjunction, which is all for superposition. And what Richard Feynman was able to show back in 1982 was that just by going searching these codes and these primitives, you can actually turn a problem that gets exponentially harder, it takes exponentially more work or more hardware, or more resources for a classical computer to do becomes polynomially easy for a quantum computer. It may just use a quadratic instead of exponential amount of resources and, and hardware. And so that's what really determines is these codes and these primitives. And so another way of asking the question is what should we leave and what should we throw out is asking the question of what are the right codes and what are the right primitives? That we should be that the that we should be copying from the brain to build our computer with our neuromorphic computer with, and so I'm going to, you know, try to address this from first principles, right? And by that I mean that we hold these truths to be self-evident. Okay, that work equals force times distance. Okay, so when you use a force of twelve newtons to push something five meters, you do sixty joules of work. Okay. And in a circuit for an electrical signal, it's similar, you know, you're moving charge around a circuit and the distance that you move, that a signal propagates is proportional to the amount of charge that has to move. And so that's kind of like, you know, how big this thing is. And so then you need proportionally more work to move it around. And so um, it turns on that in a, in a circuit also or in a chip or even in the brain as well the amount of work that a signal does is proportional to the distance that it has to travel. And so that's all we need to do to calculate from press principles if we chose a setting code or a setting primitive, how much work we would do or how much more efficient we would be. Okay, so let's walk you through that for a, a, a circuit that looks like GPT trees, GPT trees stack of these decoder transformers, which are shown here. And I just want to point out that in this case, each element of the vector that we are passing from one stage to the next is produced by what we will be analogous to a neuron in the brain. And these, you know, weights that are inside those matrices that we are multiplying this vector by to get the next vector will be analogous to the weight or the strength of a connection in the brain, which is determined by a synapse between the two neurons. Okay. And then in terms of how many signals we are sending around, we want to know how many neurons they are. And that's equal to the width of each layer times the depth of the whole stack, right? And so, you know, the number of total number of neurons and therefore the total number of signals we are sending around is depth times width. And, you know, we have to then, you know, to figure out how far these signals have to go and therefore how much work they're going to do. We have to try and lay this thing out on a chip to sort of get these distances, right? 
And so um, you, we want to in particular be able to lay out these local, dense local connections where every neuron here talks to every neuron in the next layer. And these, in this case, it's feed forward, but it could be feedback like I mentioned earlier. And we also want to be able to implement these past global projections. These are like the residual connections that skip some layers or they project to another stack of decoders here. Actually, they're called encoders that are translating the thing to a different language and so forth. And so I'm going to sort of lay out that kind of network, okay? And so if we do this in 2D like we do on chips, then I've shown you here an example where I have 10 neurons in each layer and I have 10 layers. And so these connections from these 10 neurons to all of these 10 neurons, I implement with what's called a crossbar. And for each layer, I have a crossbar. So I have 10 of these crossbars. And if you zoom into one of these crossbars, you can see that there's these uh, purple lines. These are the interconnects. Those are modeling these sort of global connections. And then we have these local lines here. This will be called a word line which sends the signal to all of these memory cells. These memory cells store the weights between this incoming signal and that outgoing signal here, which this line is called the bit line. It sums all those signals together and it feeds them to the next neuron or the next unit. And this memory cell basically takes a voltage on this line, multiplies it by some conductance that's represented by the memory bits stored in there to get a current that flows along this line. So it does the vector matrix multiplication for us, okay? And, um, and so that's how this looks on a chip. And then the number of, you know, um, bit lines that we have correspond to the width of this layer as do the number of word lines, right? And then when we tile all these crossbars here, since each one has a, this is equal to width and there's depth of, as many of them as we have depth, then the distances in this direction are proportional to width times depth or the total number of neurons. So we find out that as the number of neurons increases, we have to send each signal a farther distance. And we also have more signals to send around. So that's why you get energy scaling because the number of signals times the work each signal does gives us the energy we use scaling like neuron squared. So I'm just gonna walk you through that step by step. So amount of work is proportional to distance and the longest distance we have to go is width times depth. The number of signals is proportional number of neurons and the number of neurons is also goes like width times depth. So the total amount of energy that we need is the number of work, amount of work each signal does times the number of signals, which is this times that. And both of these things are proportional to neurons. So we get neuron squared. Okay, so that's a quadratic increase in amount of energy or electricity we're consuming if we, as we increase the number of neurons. So if we double the number of neurons or units in a neural network or deep neural network, we're gonna use four times more energy or electricity and proportionally emit more carbon heat and carbon emissions will increase as well. And so this is the, Bad news, okay. <laughs> but the good news is that we can actually get it to work, right? Because when we use more energy, we dissipate more heat. And if we don't want the chip to melt, we have to let that heat, exchange that heat with the air, right? And that means that we have to have enough surface area here. In fact, the surface area should increase at the same rate that the amount of heat we are dissipating is increasing, which means, which is proportional to the amount of energy we are using. So. It turns out that the area is width times depth times width times depth. So the area is also increasing like neuron squared and therefore it's proportional to the amount of energy, which means that this thing is not gonna overheat and we call that a thermally viable solution. Okay, so that's how we are doing things right now. We have these 2D chips and we are scaling quadratically, okay? How could we do better? Well, you can see that immediately from this equation, right? We wanna use less energy, we have to either do less work for each signal, which means we have to go a shorter distance, or we have to have fewer signals, which means we have to be more smart about how we encode information in these signals. So first we're gonna talk about reducing the amount of work, and then we'll talk to, about reducing the amount of signals. I'd like to make the analogy with when we are building these 2D, 2D chips that are spread out and signals have to travel these long distances. I like to make the analogy with Los Angeles, 
that's the Los Angeles model. And in order to shorten the distances, we have to go to the Manhattan model where we replace these suburban sprawl with these skyscrapers. And so then everything is closer together and you know people spend less time commuting, right? And so how does that work? Okay, so in this case, we just stack the crossbars instead of tiling them. So that's a skyscraper. And even after we, anyway, we'll talk about these distances later, but it turns out that even when we stack 128 of these layers, this distance is just 10 microns, okay? 0 0.01 of a millimeter, where this is several millimeters or even a centimeter. And so then our dominant distance becomes this, which is proportional to the width of a layer. And the and so we are not so our work now is proportional to width of a layer, not width times depth. And we are still sending signals proportional to the total number of neurons. And so the energy work time signals is the work, which is the width times the number of signals, which is width times depth. So width squared times depth. If we scale width and depth like the square root of the total number of neurons then this gives us a solution that scales as the 1.5 power instead of the second power, all right? And that's just making the depth proportional to the width. And then the area, again, because the height is so short, most of the heat dissipates on the top and the bottom, the sides have negligible area. So then the top has an area of width squared and that's proportional to the number of neurons because we said width is gonna go like square root of number of neurons. And so this is a problem. So it means the area is not proportional to the energy, right? The energy is increasing like neurons to the 1.5 power. We have four times more neurons. We use eight times more energy, but our surface area only increases by a factor of four. And so this means that as we increase the height of the stack, the chip is gonna fry, okay? And so even though 3D shortens distances and makes signals have to do less work, it reduces surface area even more than it shortens, it shortens distances. And so that's the problem that we have. So we have to do, pull another trick, okay? What is that trick? Okay, so let's go back to the Los Angeles versus Manhattan analogy, right? What's happening here is that we've taken all the smog that these guys are producing in LA across that whole urban sprawl. And if we don't change the way that we move people around, we move them around the same way in Manhattan, then we concentrate that smog over that small island of Manhattan. And that's what we're happening. That's like the chip overheating. Nobody can live there. Nobody can stand the pollution. So you'll notice that in Manhattan, they don't allow you, or they make it very difficult for you to drive your cars around. And they encourage people to hop on the subway because one subway car can move so many people and emit maybe less smog than a car. So you have to basically, so the analogy here is that, you know, we should reduce the number of signals that we're sending around, the amount of traffic by packing more bits of information into each signal. That's like packing more people into each car, okay? And then you have fewer cars around and less smog, which in our case is heat, okay? And so it turns out that this can be done, right? And it's actually what neurons do. And because neurons use what's called nary signaling, they don't use binary signaling. Let me explain what I'm talking about. So if I have like two neurons, like I have here, this will be called a two re signal, okay? Now, when this neuron fires, I can send one of two messages by making this guy fire or that guy fire, right? If I want to, if I make another guy fire, then I can also still choose one or the other. So I can send a total of four different messages with two spikes. It goes like two to the number of spikes. So in this case, where I have three spikes, I have two to the three sequences that I can make. And each spike, because it's one of two choices, carries one bit, right? When this guy spikes, that's the zero. And when this guy spikes, that's the one. Okay, this is a binary code. And the maximum number of bits you can pack into each signal is one bit, okay? But neurons don't work in groups of two. Like we told you like one layer, in the case of GPT-3 has like 12,000 <laughs> neurons of signal. So we have 12,000 guys we can choose from to send a signal. And in this case, you know, just because I can't fit 12,000 guys on this page, let's consider that we have 10 guys. Then we have 10 ways of choosing who could just spike the first spike. We have another different 10 ways of choosing the second spike. We have 10 ways of choosing the third spike. So three spikes 
can encode 10 to the three different sequences or messages. And each spike is carrying 3.3 bits because two raised to the 3.3 is 10, right? So now this is like people are driving around with four people in their car or three people in their car, their car pulling instead of just one guy. We reduce the amount of heat that we are, <laughs> we are, we are dissipating proportionately, right? And so this is in general, when we have N guys that we can choose from, because we have a layer of N neurons, we have an NRE code in each bit or each signal, each spike carries log to the base two N bits, okay? So that's the equivalent of our trains or public transportation system on a chip, okay? Now, the other question we have to answer here is like, okay, in the end, how many of these signals or how few can we make the signals we're sending around? It turns out that there's a good answer for that too, right? But let me just remind you. So now this N here represents to how many neurons I have in a layer, right? And then L is the number of layers that I have. And so the total number of neurons is N times L, which I call capital N, not small N, okay? And so now imagine that I had 10 neurons. My total number of neurons was 10. It turns out the way these neurons work, you can describe by saying that, look, I have some data and maybe so like this is an example, that's a data point. And it lives in this three dimensional space. That's called a data manifold. That's where all the data is distributed, right? And so even though there are like 10 inputs coming into these neurons, right? The data doesn't live in 10 dimensional space. It lives in a three dimensional manifold in that space. And so the question is that if I know that my data lives in three dimensions, how many signals do these neurons have to send to tell me which data point I'm looking at or was presented, right? So I've shown you this data point here. And let's say that this orange neuron here, you know, gives me a signal that encodes the distance of this data point from that orange plane. Okay, and when the data point is on the other side of the orange plane, it's just quiet, it doesn't fire. This is actually how neurons and deep neural networks encode information. And then, so then if I get the signal from this neuron, I know that, okay, I'm this far in that direction. If I get a signal from this neuron, I know I'm this far in that direction. And if I get a, neuron from the, a signal from the red neuron, I know I'm that far in that direction. So then I've nailed my position, right? So I only need three signals in the population of 10 neurons, right? And so that's what's happening. I have N neurons slicing D dimensions. And in the case where these planes are randomly oriented, it looks like this if I took a 2D slice, right? And in that case, you can show theoretically, just by counting argument, counting these regions, that the number of regions you know, by regions, I mean these dice, we are dicing it, we are slicing it in all these directions and we end up with these little dice, okay? How many dice there are is increasing geometrically with the number of dimensions that the data, you know, occupies, right? Okay. And the geometric ratio is the number of neurons per dimension and then times E, okay? And so if I want to now make sure that I'm sending enough signals, so that I can tell which of these dice, which of these little regions the data point is in, then I want, I'm using NRE signaling. And if I send S signals, then I have N to the S sequences. I want the number of messages that I'm sending those sequences to be bigger than the number of regions that I have. That way I can use a different message for each region and I can identify them. And so if you solve this equation, you find out the number of signals you need to send, it's something like proportional to D because both of these things increase geometrically with S and D times log of this. And for typical numbers, this thing is close to one. So the number of signals you have to send is actually proportional to the dimensionality of the data, not the width of the network, like what we're doing now. So what's the dimensionality of the data? Well. Before I, I show that, let me just walk you through the calculation now. So we're just doing this calculation one last time and then we're not doing any more math. I know you guys have done enough, enough work for a Saturday evening, right? Okay, so, so, so we are gonna wrap it up very, very no more math. Okay, but this is the last one, so pay attention, okay? So the amount of work you do, again, is proportional to distance. Distance is proportional to width because this dimension is negligible. 
The number of signals now is not width times depth, right? Because we're not gonna send, every neuron is not gonna signal. Only D of those neurons are gonna signal. So the number of signals we have is proportional to dimensions, right? And we have to do this for every layer, which is proportional to depth. So the number of signals is depth times dimensions. So when we put that together, energy is going like width times depth times dimension. That's like width times depth is number of neurons. Okay, so now we have energy scaling like number of neurons. We've dropped it to a linear from quadratic to 1.5 to linear. Okay, and then what about heat? Is that gonna save us? Yes, because previously we saw that our area goes like number of neurons. And so now our energy has dropped so that it's scaling just like the area. And that's thermally viable. So that solves the whole puzzle, right? And it tells us what are the codes we need to be using in this neuromorphic computer, okay? And so now let's compare this prediction that we can build something where the energy scales linearly with the size of the problem, the number of units. Um, but before I say that, let's say how much energy could we save if we take these 12,000 neurons in GP3 and one layer of GPT3 and we say, well, what's the dimensionality of the data? And it turns out the dimensionality is only about 100. You can measure this empirically. And so we can go from 12,000 to 100. That's like 120 times less signals. Remember, I told you you need to sort of drop, be 100 times more efficient for it to run on your phone. And we are doing that. And so what about ImageNet? So this is a vision task where you have to recognize one of these images. Well, each image is 150,000 pixels. So that would be like the number of signals that you normally be sending around. But if you look at, sorry, um, if you look at the um, dimensionality of the data, you know, the data doesn't live in that full 150,000 dimensional space. It lives on some small manifold. It's called a manifold <laughs> because it's just like some surface and it's between 26 and 43. So that's as many signals you need to, to send around. In this case, you could reduce the number of energy you're using like a 10,000 fold, right? And so if we're able to drop the energy we are using 100 or 1,000 fold, that takes us from kilowatts of electricity to watts of electricity, which is enough to go from running on the cloud to running on your phone, okay? So, 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 so this is all just come from first principles. And it's saying that this is the, the way we wanna code signals. It could be much more efficient combined with 3D really sort of gives us a much more supreme scaling than what we're getting now. Okay, so just to summarize here, so we went from this urban sprawl to this Manhattan model, Los Angeles Island model. And then we also, on top of that, we replaced uh, tons of, you know, very inefficient signals carrying very few bits with few very efficient signals carrying lots of bits. And together, it makes the whole thing work. And this is what the brain is doing. Now, why do I say that's what the brain is doing? Well, we can compare, we can go and look at the brain and we can see if I take like a mouse brain, a rat brain, a monkey brain and so forth, how many neurons do they have and how much energy do they use? And does that scale linearly with the number of neurons? It turns out it does. So like this is number of neurons in the brain going from a hundred million to like a hundred billion from like a mouse to us. And this is the amount of energy that brain uses per unit time. Okay, the amount of energy they use in the same time. And you can see here, this is a log log scale and this is a slope of one, which means there's a linear dependence. Okay, so the brain, if we wanna match the brain, we need to do exactly what I prescribed. Okay, if we don't do 3D plus binary, basically we started out with 2D and binary. This is what we are doing now on the chips we are building right now. That gives you a power of two. So this is the amount of energy you'll be using for a setting size of problem or size of network will be much larger mm -hmm. and it will get bigger and bigger as the problem gets bigger. Now, if we go to 3D, but we still stick with these binary signals, we get 1.5. And then we also can't operate those guys in parallel because we generate too much heat. It has to operate sequentially. So we lose a lot of compute computational capacity. And, but if we do, 3D and NRE, you know, we go to the full Manhattan model, Manhattan model, and we put in the public transportation, okay? Then we can get this linear scaling. 
Okay, so in the last minute or so, I know I've, uh, I'm, I'm out of time. We're just gonna spend a minute to give you a little glimpse of actually, you know, how these energy signals are processed and decoded in the brain. And, you know, that's what we have to implement. So this is talking now about the primitives or the operations we have to perform on these codes, okay? So the equivalent of entanglement and superposition, okay? And so um, what I'm showing here is that this combination of 3D and NRE is not enough because NRE is how we encode the information. We also have to be able to decode it. And the way we decode it is by sensing the order in which these spikes occur, right? And if we do those three, we're able to match the brain in here. And so what am I talking about? So remember we said we're gonna use NRE signals and there's gonna be like S of those NRE signals. So in this case, let's say we had this many NRE signals in a sequence, and this is time, and this is the neuron that's spiking, right? And those are the spikes. And so what happens is that those neurons send those signals, those spikes to a, and another neuron, and it collects those spikes on an elongated structure called the dendrite, okay? You know, it's not like the way we do it right now where we just sum everything together in one point. That's not what happens in the brain. Okay, you have these dendrites and each axon comes in and it contacts one of these little spines here. And the next guy with the next spine contacts the next, the next spine, right? And so they are delivered in what's called spatial temporal order. And when they come in in that order from the tip towards the stem, then this thing gets excited and it makes what's called a dendritic spike that then propagates all the way and makes this guy fire. Okay, so these dendrites can decode these sequences. Those are the, these are the primitives, or these are the operators that we need to build to use these codes. And so here, I'm just gonna show you a simulation of this just so it's more tangible for you, right? So what I did is I just basically put together a little model of a dendrite here with 20 inputs coming in. And you know this will be the spatial dimension where we are along the dendrite. And these snapshots at different times are shown here. And when it gets to be more towards a brighter or hotter color, that means the voltage is increasing. And when it gets white, that's one of those dendritic spikes that's recognizing that that sequence happened. Now, if you start swapping spikes in the sequence so they don't occur in the right order, you basically, one swap is fine, but two swaps, you don't get the spike, okay? And I have little animations here showing what happens. So this is like the voltages happening in different segments. You can see here when it takes off, that's the spike. When I swap ones here, you can see here in this particular instance, it didn't get it, it didn't spike. And uh, it built up, but it didn't build up enough to cross that threshold to spike. And that's, there's some probability there. Sometimes it will spike, sometimes it won't spike. But when you switch like two or three, you can see it's building up less and less, right? And so that's what's happening in one of these dendrites. And we understand how it works. We only discovered this thing over the last 10 years. And so this all jives with these first principles. Um, this is just some quantification of how likely you are to, to get a spike as you swap the, the order of spikes. And so I'm going to sum up with putting this all in context, okay? So when I talk about your father's neural network, basically 60 years ago, the way we thought the brain worked, that was what led to these deep neural networks that we're building now, right? And these conceptions of how the brain works has evolved over the past 60 years, thanks to the intense amount of work that these neuroscientists that study the brain have done. And so we started out with what I call a synaptocentric conception. And this is what a deep neural network is, is adopting. You know, basically it encodes a non-negative non -negative part of its weighted inputs, which it, uh, and it decodes those same positive signals by summing them and weighting them with these positive or negative weights. And that's the matrix multiplications that we perform in these GPUs and TPUs. And it's been amazingly successful, but it's not scalable. It's not sustainable. And a lot of people are not happy with the experience, <laughs> the user experience. And so, you know, the next conception of how the brain works is what's called the axocentric conception. I tell you that these axons, they route these spikes, okay? And you, so this idea of spikes is captured by this axocentric conception where you encode information in the rate at which these spikes occur or what time they occur relative to each other. And you decode that information by integrating over time. And this was 
the initial concept for a neuromorphic chip, which is still what we are building today in terms of these neuromorphic chips, but, but that's where that they were based on that conception. But the general idea that Kavamid proposed in 1982 was that we should base these chips on the organizing principles of the brain. And so as our understanding or our conception of how the brain works has evolved, we are now at the point where the right, the way we think the brain works and which also offers a lot of benefits for neuromorphic chips, it's this dendrocentric conception. We focus on the dendrite. And in this case, the rank of a spike in a sequence is what's encoding information. And the way that you decode these sequences is by filtering spatial temporally. In other words, you can't separate space from time when you do this. The way that you wait on input depends on the time it arrived as well as the position it was, right? And that's the little simulation that I showed uses that principle in order to recognize the, the uh, the sequence. And this is how we are going to be able to build silicon brains in 3D that are going to be supreme in the same way that the brain, real brain is supreme over, you know, the chips we are building now. And so are we there yet? Well, you know, we want to go 3D. And in fact, the memory industry already went 3D back in 2013. You know, in 2007, they gave up on these 2D chips. They said, well, we need to pack a lot more memory on a chip. And so they started building more and more layers of transistors and wires on a chip. And now just this year, they are up to 128 layers on a chip. And each one of these chips, which is only like less than 10 microns tall, is packing, you know, a, terab a terabit, a trillion bits. And since it's only 10 microns tall, they can basically stack eight of these chips so that they have a terabyte. And that slips into your nice slim phone. So you can get a terabyte phone right now. Now to put that in context, GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters. So that's gonna fit in your phone with room to spare. And what we are saying is that it could compute inside that 3D memory chip by using these NRE signaling approach, we could do the compute right there inside the memory and it could run on your phone and the energy and the heat, everything will work out, okay? Now, so I find these memories really incredible. Doesn't it look like Manhattan skyline, huh? Okay, <laughs> so, um, but you know, it's like this amazing, you know, uh, uh, structure here where every metal plane here intersects these yellow silicon channels, they are called macaroni, uh, <laughs> macaronis, and forms a transistor. And there's a layer inside the insulator between the channel and the gate that can trap charge. And that's where they store the memory. So different levels of charge correspond to different bit patterns. They can start to three or four bits. And that's all happening inside this amazing, incredible technology. And so I think that's the way forward. And um, I'm going to uh, basically say we are here right now, but <laughs> you know, if we can leverage the, the incredible work that the memory guys have done, it's not, it won't take as much less than 13 years to, to, get, to, uh, <laughs> to, get, to get there. And in terms of that's the hardware, what about the software? Well, in terms of the software, basically we're at the point where we proposed or we've discovered the right codes and operators that we need to use to build a neurally supreme computer. Okay, just like Feynman discovered the codes and operators, you know, civil position and entanglement and qubits for a quantum computer in 1982. And it took till 1994 before uh, Peter Shore came up with a quantum, the first quantum algorithm which can factor numbers, integers into primes. And um, that took 12 years, but I hope it doesn't take us that long to come up with algorithms for these neurally supreme computers. But that's where we are. And thank you so much for your attention. And thanks to ONR and Stanford and Gray AI Matter Labs for funding and a gift to, from Craig Reynolds. And I also want to thank all these students, incredibly brilliant, hardworking, and creative students that I had the opportunity to work with over the last several decades who contributed to these ideas. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor Bohan, for this amazing talk. Um, certainly you've covered a lot of great things covering um, like this 
biological inspiration for these, this new class of chips that's coming along and how we can make these um, neural networks more efficient. And so we, in the future, we can further um, have these run on our devices and just have um, bring AI to more people. So I think um, we're gonna start off with um, a question that's on our Slido page. Just a reminder to everyone in our audience, um, if you have any questions, just make sure to drop in the Slido. So um, this audience member is asking, how far away do you think we are from building such brain-like silicon chips? Yeah, um, the ones I described again, I said, um, we are just now discovering the way we should be building them. <laughs> uh, and, and um, you know, being able to identify the right codes and primitives out of all those details and amazing findings about the brain. And by combining sort of the, the neuroscience knowledge with bottom up first principles kinds of approaches. Um, and so I think it could happen very quickly because you know, especially if we could leverage the amazing 3D technology that was already in your phone, <laughs> you know, these memory chips. So, so, but, you know, like I said, uh, in the past, it took much longer. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, pro technology or, or progress is much faster these days than it was in the 80s. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. But again, also it depends on all of you guys getting into it. <laughs> all right, it's all about people. Um, okay, so we're still waiting for other questions to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess one question that I have is, um, oh, okay, here's actually one that just came in. I'll just use this one for now. So the, the question is from someone anonymous. They said, do you think computation ICs based on analog and mixed signal instead of digital can enable edge-based or near sensor-based computing? Yeah, you see, I didn't mention the word analog in, my, in the talk because, you know, the main message here is, um, let me give you some background, um, you know, which will help you answer that question. But the, the main message is that we are spending all the time, the energy not on calculation, but on communication or on signaling, right? And the reason why that is, is that, you know, over 50 years of Morse law, right? We started with something like 10 micron technology, you know, transistors were like 10 microns. And now we have 10 nanometer technology. So transistors have shrunk in linear dimension, a factor of a thousand. That means you can fit a million times more transistors on a chip than you did before. And the chip area has actually increased by a factor of 15. So you can actually fit 15 million transistors on a chip. That's why you've gone from 2000 transistors to something like 30 billion transistors on a chip. And not only that, the oh, 30 million transistors, yeah, 30 billion from 2000, you know, that's, that's 15 million times. And not only that, when you make the devices smaller, like you make them a thousand times shorter, they switch a thousand times faster. So 15 million times more transistors on a chip, that's 15 billion times more calculations per second. Okay. But so that's the good news. The bad news is that because <laughs> the transistors are so tiny, you can multiply two numbers together, 32 bit numbers together, and you can only go, and it only moves like one micron. That, all that logic fits in a few microns. But whereas the data has to move several millimeters across the chip. So millimeters versus microns, that's a thousand times more energy to move the data around to communicate. And so if you took that 32 by 32 multiplication and you replace it by some fancy analog thing, some new device that uses even less power, you won't see any drop in your electricity because all your electricity is going to move the data around. It's a thousand times, you know, 99.9% .9 of your energy budget is, is communicating, signaling, okay? And so that's why it doesn't matter what you put in there <laughs> to do the calculation. Yeah, it's not gonna change, it's not gonna move, the, move the, the dial. And so that's why I focus on 3D because if you can shorten wires, then you spend less energy calculating, I mean, communicating. And if you can send fewer signals around, you send less energy. So that's what, that's what you focus on. And that's what the brain focuses on too. <laughs> 
All right. So um, there's one question that I personally had, which was just um, you're someone whose uh, research is very interdisciplinary, um, obviously bridging um, uh, both computer science and also um, biology. So just as someone who works in an interdisciplinary field, what sort of advice do you have for students um, when it comes to uh, kind of finding a balance and working in multiple fields and pursuing that sort of interest? Yeah, I, I um, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure exactly which aspect you're talking about, like advice, how do you get into multidisciplinary fields or how do you gather all this knowledge or, you know, is there some part that is more important than others? Can you, you know, enlighten me? Yeah, I think just perhaps, I think getting the knowledge base to really kind of do um, like perform research on like an interdisciplinary subject. Yeah, um, there's several levels at which I can answer that question. But, you know, what I've done personally is I just followed my curiosity. You know, I describe it as, you know, um, raising my consciousness. So I basically, you know, the, the, you know, the Kwabna you're talking to now is not the same Kwabna that was 10 years ago. And part of why I didn't talk about anything I did in the past is because now I look at it completely differently because I've raised my consciousness. And so, you know, to learn anything, you have to be motiva motivated and curious about it. So I can't tell you what to learn. You just learn what you're motivated and curious about. But what you'll find is that as you learn what you're motivated and curious about, new questions are going to arise that you didn't think of before because you raised your consciousness you were unconscious before of those questions. And so when you raise your consciousness, you see new questions and you see that those questions are actually more important than the questions you thought before. And, you know, in fact, those questions will look stupid to you, okay, <laughs> that you thought before, okay? And you should intentionally pick, pick questions that you know very little about because that's where you raise your consciousness the most. And then, that question becomes stupid, okay? So, so, so then you just follow your nose. So, so, so then I realized that, oh, wow, that's important. I didn't appreciate that before. Then I learned that area. And then it raises my consciousness. And then there's the things I say, oh, why should I miss this whole thing about, you know, I never, you know, the reason why I actually talked about quantum computing is that I actually learned that lesson that I never realized before that it's the codes and the primitives that determine supremacy. I thought it's something fancy we do or this and that and that. But you know, if you look at the whole story, that's the message. And so I went back and I said, hmm, interesting. So I should be able to show if I find the right codes and primitives that I'm supreme. I change the scaling from quadratic to linear. I don't have, need any algorithm just from the codes and the primitives. Um, Feynman was able to show that he can make an exponentially hard problem, polynomially hard with no algorithms. And so, and so that, you know, I was unconscious of that before until like just a year ago. Um, so, yeah, thank you for the answer. Um, Did it so, answer your question? Yeah, that's was, that was perfect. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so I'm just gonna ask another question from Slido because there were a lot that uh, came in. Okay. So uh, this person asks, um, so do you think optical, optical computing, so PICs, could uh, have a role to play in energy efficient brain chips? Um, you know, I don't, I haven't followed the latest breakthroughs, right? But, you know, when, when I was trying to get silicon to generate light, you know, for every billion photons that I, <laughs> electrons that I send through, I would get one photon, right? It's very converting, you know, carrying in, in silicon to, to, to a light is very inefficient. And even in, in other materials, it's, it's just very inefficient. And so it's all about efficiency. And, you know, so yeah, if you can do it efficiently, more efficiently than you can do it, <laughs> then, then go for it. But I think there's a real challenge there. If you have to convert to optical, you lose you're not efficient and then you have to come back to electrical, you're also not gonna be 100% efficient. So there's overhead involved there. And the fundamental reason is that, you know, photons are bosons. 
electrons are fermions. This means that electrons can interact with other electrons. They see them, they feel them, <laughs> they interact. Bosons, two bosons can occupy the same place, the same time, the same energy level at the same, at the same time. They don't see each other, they don't interact. Computation is all about interaction. So you have to convert a boson to some other particle that interacts to compute or interact with some material or something. So, so then there's inefficiencies going back and forth. First principles. <laughs> I think looking at the chat, um, one audience member is asking about like enhancing the human brain with such technology to address, um, they talk specifically about addressing medical issues like dementia and Alzheimer's. But I think, um, I guess just broadly speaking, have, it, have you considered um, just like neuromorphic computing and like recent advances in like BCI and like brain computer interfaces? Uh, or what, what do you think about such technologies? Yeah, it's, it's a, um, I have considered it. And um, I would say, you know, the question really is, again, it's a question of overhead. You have to convert. And the biggest challenge is in the interface, right? Because you interface some foreign material with a brain, electrical signals with some kind of chemical signals and so on. And, you know, you saw, you saw that chat, right? stuff is happening down at the micron level in the brain and the resolution of these things are so fine. And so that's a challenge and there's overhead involved in that conversion. And so at the same time, if you follow what's happening in biology, you know, we can actually engineer biology itself. Yeah, because now biology has become a technology. That's how you have this vaccine so fast, right? This mRNA based vaccine, you can just write software and print the RNA, you get a new vaccine. If the, if the thing mutates, you sequence it, you, you make, you know. So, so this is what you're doing. You're engineering, we're engineering biology. And I think that's a more promising route to fix it because it's just programs expressed inside the cells that cause the problem <laughs> and then you just have to, yeah. So, 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 and people have done that. Like, you know, like blind patients, they can basically in fact, you can get knee surgery now, they'll put stem cells inside your knee and the stem cells will grow you a new, a new kneecap or whatever. And, you know, they can put stem cells inside your eye and you'll get new photoreceptors and so forth. So, so it, it's happening. Okay, so um, maybe one, one last question. Um, so, so someone, someone says that um, you, you mentioned the 3D silicon brain, could it be non-silicon or hybrid silicon and non-silicon, for example, carbon nanotube? Um, yeah, so, so again, it's all about scale, right? Why do you think you're so smart? <laughs> Why do you think you're so much smarter than a monkey? The monkey doesn't have any kind of special fancy kind of neuron. I mean, you don't have any special kind of fancy neuron, special kind of fancy ion channel, special kind of fancy kind of synapse. But it's all the same stuff that a mouse has, right? But you got a hundred billion of them and the mouse has 10 million, right? And so the reason why we're so smart, and this is why GPT-3 kicks GPT-2's ass and GP 2 <laughs> kicks GPT-1's ass, it's 175 billion parameters, you know? It can do stuff that the other guy never dreamt of, right? So it's all about scale. It's, you know, I don't care what technology it is. The technology that will allow me to build something with a hundred billion neurons, like the scale of the brain and fit it, you know, in a small space and use very little energy, that's what I care about. And so far, just because of the, you know, the memory guys, they started in 2007. Every year they invest a billion dollars into fab, into this fab. Okay, so that's like $17 billion of investment to be able to stack 128 liters. You know, nobody else is going to get there. Nobody's guy is going to put in. You have to have. It's just like GPUs. The reason why we are using GPUs now to train deep neural networks is because you guys played games. You bought these things, so we're making money. So we continue to develop the chips, and then, you know, it's called the hardware lottery. So we just won the lottery. 
And that's why we're able to do these <laughs> deep neural networks. Now, it turned out that the, the GPUs which weren't supposed to do this are good at it, right? And so they, we won the lottery, right? And so you want to win the lottery, you know? <laughs> and 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 uh, and so because you can't develop, you know, I can't, nobody's going to give me a $17 billion grant to build something with 20, you, you know, somebody has, some, some consumer has to be buying that thing so we're making profit so we can invest. And then we leverage that. And the, so they, they've already done this with memory, so. All right, I think um, we're at 9.45 now, so I think it's a good time to adjourn. Uh, thank you so okay. much, Professor Bohan, okay. yeah, for your yeah. wonderful talk. Thanks everybody for, for putting up with all my math on a, on a Saturday evening. And <laughs> but hopefully you'll have the YouTube and, and access to the slides. I can post the slides to if Peter wants and you can take your time and you can look through it and, and go over it. But uh, it's been great talking to you guys and uh, you know, just raise your consciousness, just be curious and you know open-minded okay Thank all right you.